Turn to that first verse you see there, John chapter 3. That ought to be an easy chapter to find. That's where 316 is while I straighten this up. Oh my, look at this. You know, I don't believe in evolution at all, but I do believe that knots tie themselves. They would have to, because nobody ties them, but they always end up being, look at that, it's tied up. Yeah. All right. Ta-da. John chapter 3. Now, uh, let me read that. And we'll read this together this morning. John 3, 28. Ye yourselves bear me witness. This is uh, uh, John. This is John the Baptist. It's what he said concerning Christ. He said, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ. That is something, I tell you what, I wish more and more preachers would just spend a little while studying John the Baptist's life because there are too many preachers who I don't want to say that they think they are Jesus Christ, but they certainly exalt and elevate themselves and others elevate them to the status of like when they speak, it's like Jesus talking. And I just don't go for that at all. I do not go for that. A man that God has called to preach the gospel, he's just a man. He's a human being like everybody else is. He can be wrong like everybody else can be wrong. And John the Baptist here wearing this camel fur coat, eating locusts and wild honey, um, not exalting himself one bit, giving the glory to the, who it belongs, it's Jesus Christ. He said, I'm not the Christ. He could have, e listen, he could have easily said, I'm the Messiah. He could have easily done that. He already had a following. People were leaving the city and coming out to the River Jordan to be baptized by him because of his preaching. He could have, he could have capitalized on that, made a lot of money. That's not what he did. It's not what he was for. He that hath, and so he said, but that I am sent before him. And he says in verse 29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. So he's talking about Christ and the church is the bride. But the friend of the bridegroom, which is John the Baptist, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegrooms. Whenever I do, whenever I do weddings, uh, I guess this tradition comes from this, and I never really thought about it, but I will walk out usually from over there before anybody else does. I'll walk out with the groom and his best man, and they will walk out together with me, and I'll stand them right there, and then the groom and his best man will stand there and wait as all these bridesmaids comes down and the, uh, the other fellows that are in that group and then here comes the bride and that that friend of the bridegroom that best man that's his place there is to support that man and when i say who who has the ring it's going to be him so if that helps you make sense of this passage i think that's what's i think our tradition stems from that but anyway he rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice this my joy therefore is fulfilled now watch this he must increase but I must decrease. And that should be written on a plaque and put in every pastor's office everywhere in the world. Is that Christ must increase while we decrease. Amen. Now, um, <clears throat> I mentioned to you before, and before we left, what my thinking was. Let me go back a little bit. Uh, several years ago, about five or six years ago, um, we got invited by some families that live in the general area of Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, some of them, some of them actually live in Indianapolis, and some of them live 
out far away. Um, but um, the, the place that we started going to is a little town called Delphi, Indiana, and in that area. And it's all flat ground. It's all either cornfield or soybeans everywhere. So they were, they were bringing in their harvest or getting ready to. They were getting ready to harvest there in Indiana. Usually they, they are harvesting by the time we get there. <clears throat> but anyway, it's usually been a small gathering. And in fact, those of you who are here in Sunday school, you're about twice as many as what we would have in this gathering in, in Delphi. But we were going out there because our families there are faithful and we would do uh, like a prophecy conference, prophecy Bible study and so on. And um, uh, one family, they would put an ad in the paper advertising it. And I think uh, over the few years that we did that, we might have had one, maybe two, maybe three people uh, that would come in that we didn't know. Uh, there is a, a group of that you would think they're Amish or Mennonite, but they're not. They refer to themselves as German Baptists. And from what I found out, the German Baptists actually have a lot better doctrine than the Amish and Mennonite. Mennonites and Amish are saved by rules. They are. They are saved 100% by following their rules. And you lose your salvation by breaking the rules. You can be cast out if you don't have your suspenders on right. And I'm not making that up. It comes down to the suspenders. It comes down to the, to the headdress for the woman, the bonnet or whatever. And if you break those rules and continue to do so, they will put you out. And if you are put out according to their doctrine, you cannot be saved. Cannot be saved. So anyway, I remember one year we had a, an older German Baptist couple come in and they seemed to enjoy it. Now, <clears throat> the, the family that um, pays for uh, renting the, the room that we're going to do the teaching in he suggested to me that we maybe go a little bit closer to Lafayette, Indiana, which is north and west of Indianapolis. Lafayette is where Purdue University is. If you've ever seen Purdue play basketball or football, that's where it is. And, and apparently it's a big deal over there um, because you'll see signs all over Lafayette saying uh, uh, sports traffic or whatever. They, they move the traffic in and out during a day game and so on. So it's a pretty big deal over there and Purdue's a fairly good sized university. So he suggested that and I had already been thinking about doing something a little different this year. Instead of just going out and doing a generic prophecy study uh, to focus on one subject, the subject that seems to be getting a lot of uh, headlines now, well, back before the, um, the Israel war was the subject of UFOs. So I thought, you know, I bet those college kids uh, would be interested in something like that. So we worked together and we were going to do basically a three night, uh, I called it UFO con, okay, a UFO convention. And so we focused on that subject. Now, um, we rented a, we were looking at hotel meeting rooms and so on. They were about seven, eight hundred dollars a night. That's a lot. Uh, but he found a venue that was owned by a big church and they rent it out. They'll use it themselves sometimes, but the church owns it. It's a great big building and it has meeting rooms in it, uh, rooms for people that are having parties and so on. Uh, and it has a big auditorium sort of like this. And, and it's exactly what I've been saying about, about where the church is going right now. That sanctuary, if you look at the picture I posted on Facebook and Twitter, that sanctuary of that church is solid black. And all the lights are meant to basically be put on the stage while you sit there literally in darkness in the pew. And I, I just, man, I just don't like that. I like it lit up. Amen. So anyway, uh, we got this venue and we were we had negotiated for one of the the rooms that would hold 50 people because I thought surely they ain't no more going to be there than that. So this family they put uh, yard signs all over Lafayette. Uh, he's got a utility trailer. He made a big banner and stuck it on the side of that. Was driving up and downtown, driving up around campus and so on. And um, then 
he put a big banner ad in the local newspaper that reached all the Lafayette area and outside of that uh, for a couple weeks. So, I mean, we tried to canvas as much as we could. So it comes down to the meeting. We don't know, and, and I told you guys, we're going to try this. We're going to lay a fleece out before the Lord and see what happens. So it came down to the night of our first meeting, and the guy that was uh, in care of the building, he said, uh, we've, we decided that if you want to, you can use this auditorium for your meeting tonight. It's not going to be in use. It'll be the same price. So, well, great, you know. So um, we got all set up and had the PowerPoints ready on both screens and so on. And um, other than a couple of families that we already know that come every year, I think there was a total of four people that showed up. And... Um, it was two men, they weren't together, and then a, a man and a, a woman, they were about middle age, I guess, and it looked like they were a couple, so they came in and sat down, so I started talking about UFOs, and, I, and then I got into talking about the Bible, and I had my Bible, and I opened up my Bible, and I started reading my Bible, and they got up and walked out. Boom, gone. And I'm, I'm thinking, didn't the sign say, think Bible? Every sign, every banner that we put up said, think Bible on it. Okay? So they had to have known that a Bible was going to be part of this lecture that I was going to give. As soon as I started in with Scripture, Sterling, out the door they went. Didn't see them no more after that. So now I'm down to two people that I don't know, okay? So I finish out the meeting. About 9 o'clock, we get done, shake their hands, tell them thank you for coming, and we went home for the night. The next day, we get to the venue at 6 o'clock. Now, they've got the big auditorium room set up for a big public dinner. Apparently, this church got some money because they filled that whole auditorium with tables and chairs and anybody who wanted to could go in there and get a free chicken dinner. Totally free. And I'm going, I'm anybody. You know, can I get some chicken? But anyway, um, we had, Lisa and I bought a tray of pastries and things like that because we didn't have any food to give people. And so we set it over there on the table. I set my camera up. I set my, my screen up. It's a smaller room. And... Uh, so, but it'll hold about 50. Uh, Lisa sets the table up and gets all the DVDs stacked up and ready to give out and so on. And, and um, it got to be 10 till 7. And this family and I were sitting there, this couple, and I'm looking at my watch and I'm going, doesn't look too good tonight, does it? No. About 5 till 7. He said, Mike, I don't think I'm going to do this again. And I said, yeah. I said, it was always with me. It was always a fleece laid out before the Lord. And uh, God, God knows my heart. He could have done anything he wanted, including not have anybody show up. And I said, I wouldn't have got my feelings all that hurt because it was just something that I thought of. And well, let's try it. So... He said, Mike, that, that money I spent on this, I could have given it to feed people in Kenya. And I told him, I said, yeah, you could have, and it would have fed some families one time. I said, but what I was looking to do, and what I'm always looking to do, is trying to increase our overall viewer base, the, the people that will watch us and watch the videos that we have and learn something and then get interested in them. And then all of a sudden, God's changing their life because of it. That's what I like. That's what I love to see. And uh, I said, so this was always about, you know, trying to increase uh, our visibility. People that don't necessarily know anything about me or know that UFOs and the Bible belong in the same sentence much less the same topic discussion. And I said, so if God 
says no, then I trust that. And I'm just going to walk with that. And uh, I said, so yeah, you could have donated money and we could have fed people one time. I said, but I was looking for a broadening the, the overall because then they will give money over and over again to help feed people in Kenya and, and continue the ministries that we're So, uh, 7 o'clock. 702, 703, 704. I told everybody, I said, you know what? Let's pack everything up. We'll go out and get a steak dinner and we'll cancel tomorrow night's meeting too. So we all got up and um, I went up front to where my laptop was, the screen, there was a TV monitor kind of like this, and um, the camera's in the back, but I didn't turn it on. And just as I'm about ready to pull the cord on the laptop, uh, a guy walks in, and he sits down in the back. And this family that paid for everything, they told me uh, that somebody from the college paper was supposed to come and interview me. I said, well, call him, tell him I'm not here because we're not going to be here. And so I don't, I don't know if he made that call or not. But anyway, with this guy coming in, sitting down, I almost told him, uh, sir, we're not having a meeting tonight. No sooner than I thought that, in comes four college students in. All four of them wearing tinfoil hats that they had made and I started laughing I went I like it and they kind of I don't know what their purpose was I don't know if they were going to mock me or what or if they were just looking for something to do to have fun I remember being in college and I remember wanting to have fun every now and then okay which is why brother George I bought a priest shirt I did. I walked around more Oklahoma with that priest shirt on. I had a lot of fun with it. Anyway. Um, and so I got, I got tickled with them. They got tickled with me when I said, I've actually got one of those. They went, no kidding. I said, yeah, I've got one. I, said, I don't have it with me. It's back home in Missouri. So now I'm, I'm instantly changed. And I taught them. The one, there was one young man there that he was focused on me. He was sort of like the talker of the group. And I asked him at some point, I said, what, why did you come here? What interested you in coming here? And he said these words. He said, I never really believed that there was a connection between UFOs and the Bible. And he said, when I saw what your ad said, I wanted to hear what that connection is. That's my audience right there. Because that guy's already interested in the subject. He's already got his mind ready to hear some things. So that's the direction I took it. Now, I didn't turn the camera on that night. It's gone. That talk is gone. But those four young people sat there and they made up everything that I said. And until such a point like 8.30, they, they said, can we, and they would ask, and about 8.30, they said, we have to go and we have to, we have a test tomorrow that we're already now going to be up till probably one o'clock in the morning. Stuff. And so if you would, I said, no, you guys go ahead. We appreciate you coming. Come tomorrow night. And I said, get some DVDs on the way out. We made up some bookmarks, QR code on it that takes right to our website. All they could do is, you know, capture it with their phone and boom, they got all my videos on UFOs and all my videos on everything else. And they left. And, um... One of the guys that came Monday night was there Tuesday night. And there, the guy that first walked in, he was at the dinner, but he decided to come in. And I could tell that he was somewhat of a, of a Christian nature. I mean, he knew some verses from the Bible and he kind of knew the answers. He knew things I was talking about. So uh, anyway, we finished up Tuesday night and uh, I immediately went to this guy and I said, I guess God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? He said, yeah, he does. And I said, here we were. We were just within minutes of walking out the door and closing this thing down. And God sends all these people in. And I'm just like, that is awesome. So, 1 Corinthians 1, 
Turn there. 1 Corinthians 1. Here's, this, is, this is my job. This is your job. Everybody is called to do this. You don't have to be called into the ministry. You don't have to be a man either. Because the, the prophet Joel said, Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. What does it mean to prophesy? E Ezekiel actually defined the term. Or God did to Ezekiel. Son of man, prophesy unto these people. Prophesy and say unto them. And prophesying is nothing more than giving somebody verses of scripture out of the Bible. And say, this is what the Bible says. That's proclaiming the word of God. And you don't have to be a man or a bishop or a preacher or an evangelist or prophet or anything like that. All you have to do is know the Bible a little bit. Know what God's done in your heart. Share with somebody some things that you learned from God from your King James Bible and you roll with that. Ladies and gentlemen, both somebody say amen. amen. Do it on Facebook too. That's how you really make people mad at you. All right, now, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Well, how can we do that if we've got four or five different translations of the Bible? Or... Pastor, you've got an NIV from the 80s, and I've got an NIV from 2020, and they don't say the same thing. How can I, how can I preach on hell and go literally go through the 54 places in the King James where it mentions the word hell, while you with your NIV have only got 13 places where it mentions hell? The rest of it, the grave or Hades. Okay, it ain't right. That you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And that all is done through having the same Bible. This man comes all the way from Goa, India. And I'm going to let him have this church this week and preach to y'all and share his heart because he uses one Bible. And he believes in that one Bible. So, uh, he said in verse 11, For it has been declared unto me uh, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, Well, I am of Paul, or I am Apollos, and I of Cephas, which is Peter. And then they got the real bragging guys. Well, we're of Jesus Christ. And later on, he says, is Christ divided? Christ is not divided. If anything, you are of God Almighty. Uh, wild olive branches graft into the tree. Because we were all out there in sin, and God took every one of us and grafted us in. Amen? Amen. So... Now, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and this is him continuing this same, this same idea. While one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave, to every man. In verse 6, I have it underlined. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And I've again, I've seen too many churches and too many church leaders and too many evangelists and too many pastors take the credit for their church's growth or their church's revival or the altar call that they had or all kinds of... You guys know me. That's one of the reasons. That, that is in my prideful state I will have if, if I give an altar call and we have a bunch of people down at the altar my nature is to gloat over that look at what I did look how God used me and so that that is the number one reason why I just don't have an altar call every time I say something 
I'd rather see how God works this in your life the next five to ten years rather than you may make a knee-jerk emotional response to me making you cry and you went down and cried a little bit and you got up from the altar and nothing in your life changed. But anyway, so it is our job, all of us, to plant the seed of the Word of God. Since everybody that you know is made out of dirt, that's exactly what you're doing. You're taking seed, even if it's a grain of mustard seed. You plant that in somebody, you put an idea of scripture into somebody's head. I guarantee you, God knows how to make that thing grow up into a... God can take the worst uh, infidel that you know and turn them into a Bible-believing preacher. He does it all the time, doesn't he, Pastor? Amen. I remember part of your testimony last time you was here. So, it's, it was my job, Monday night, Monday night to that couple that walked out. I planted the seed. Now, they're going to have to stand before God one of these days and give an account for what they heard. God is going to say, remember that old crazy guy who believed in UFOs there? You went to his little teaching deal? And how you looked at each other and, and got up and walked out because he was just getting too much in the Bible. And remember all those. In fact, God's going to say, I'm going to reel back every one of those verses that he showed you and that he told you. And they're going to come to your mind. And you're going to understand that that's what I'm going to judge you by. Because that's what Jesus said. He said, the words that I say, that's how God is going to judge this world. On the word of God. So, we plant... Now, there are pastors and there are people who are nurturing people. Anybody, anybody can throw seed out into a tilled up field. Well, I tell you what, it takes a Don Hoggard to nurture those plants all summer long. My daddy grew. He had, what, three gardens going at one time before? I mean, two, three rows of tomatoes, five or six rows of, I hate beans. Three or four rows of okra. I mean, he had them. And he nurtured those all summer long until they gave forth the fruit that he labored for. And he would sit, we would sit at the table every time he brought in fresh vegetables from the garden. We'd sit there and eat. And he would say, them slept in the garden last night. That was his favorite phrase. That slept in the garden last night. That was dad, a little bit of pride coming out on what he did. And some people are really good at that. They are nurturing. They are waterers. Man, they're growers. They're like that old boy that uh, they were going to chop down that tree because it wasn't producing any fruit. This one old boy showed up and he said, hold it, don't, don't cut it down yet. Give me one more year. And he, the Bible says he digged about it. He put in fertilizer manure or whatever it was, and he worked on that. He, because you know what he said? Every tree deserves a chance. Everybody deserves a chance. Boy, I like that. But God gives the increase. I cannot take the credit for any of it. God is the one who gets it. Amen? And God showed me that. Now, you've heard me say in the last few weeks about how I believe that people like Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, and all that crowd is actually practicing forms of witchcraft. It's called the law of attraction. And it says that when you think positive things, then God returns positive things to you. But when you, when you say a negative thing, it cancels out God's ability to work in your life and that's why you're poor and that's why you're unhealthy and that's why this and that and that's why you're not as good as me is because I never say anything negative and I don't turn negativity uh, into you know what what I want and and God always blesses me because I'm always positive I'm telling you that we sat in that room Tuesday night plum after seven o'clock and said we're never doing this again not even having this meeting tonight Lisa pack it up Let's go to the bus after our steak dinner. We never did get the steak dinner. 
I said everything negative that I could say. I thought everything negative that I could think. And so did everybody else that was with us. We were giving up. And God said, oh, no, you don't. Amen? Now, 1 Corinthians 15. Mm, 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 mm. Wednesday night. Oh, I was going to outline this for you. Monday night, four or five people showed up in a room that was designed to seat hundreds. That, that kind of got me. So the moment I began to mention and use the Bible, a couple got up and abruptly left. Tuesday night, no one came to the meeting. By 7.05, we started packing everything up, making plans to go to a steak dinner, then canceled the next night's meeting. And then came four young students from Purdue University wearing tinfoil hats. I wish I'd have got a picture of them. So 1 Corinthians 15 is the place where the rapture, the translation is mentioned. And uh, verse 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. Who gives us the victory? God did. We don't earn it ourselves, do we? I was sharing with Pastor last night. We were talking and I said, Pastor, when we talk about doing the work of God, we have to remember that we call it the work of God, so therefore we should let it be the work of God. In other words, God doing the work, not us. I was, I was within seconds, Gary, of making a mess of God's plan. And he knew it. And I'm telling you, if you think and you have been taught to me. I may not be speaking to anybody here. Maybe speaking to somebody online. If you have been told by other people and scolded by them that the reason why you are unhealthy or the reason why you are broke or the reason why you lost your job or the reason why your marriage didn't last or the reason why your kids went bad on you is because you planted negative seed in this world and you said negative things and you thought negative thoughts and I'm telling you that is called the law of attraction and it is pure 100% witchcraft okay I've read the books I know I'm not done so therefore my beloved brethren be ye steadfast the word stead is part of that it has a Latin root in it, S-T-E or S-T-A or S-T-O or S-T-I. It's a S-T with a vowel after it. Stead, stop, stage, status, statue, static, uh, statute. Those are all things that don't move. A statue doesn't move. A, a statute is a law that's not changed. A, uh, a stage is a place where people stand, okay? It's unmovable. Be ye steadfast. And then he gives you the definition of the word steadfast. Unmovable. Just like I just said. Only I took longer than God does. I always do. Always abounding in the what? Whose work is it? It's not mine. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Never is it. So, very quickly, Tuesday night, four or five more students came in. One said he didn't know that the Bible had anything to do with UFOs, so he came to the meeting to hear the subject. I did my best, and I may have been able to change some of their minds. All except one young lady who was looking at me with an evil look. She was the Jezebel for the week. And she came in, soured up on me, I even asked her a question. I don't have time to get into it, but I asked her a question and uh, she gave me the most out of the way answer because I think she knew where I was going with it and she didn't want me to have, she didn't want anybody to think that I knew anything. And finally, I, mu I don't remember what I said, but I did have the camera going and I'm going to go back on the recording and find out what I said. But I said something that tripped her, I mean, tripped her mousetrap. She jumped up out of that chair and stomped out of that room just furious at me and couldn't take no more of it. God's going to remind her of every verse that she heard that night and why she was so angry and why she was... Now, I'm not mad at her. I feel sorry for her. 
she's obviously been damaged as part of this world and been soured against preachers for whatever reason. And I feel sorry for her. I, want you to, I don't know who she is. I want you to pray for her. But the real kicker is, and I'm going to close with this. So we had about eight to ten people all together that never heard of me, that got DVDs, they got our website, and let's say two of them have enough interest to watch some of the videos, okay? If they like them, they'll share them with other people. They'll show it to other people. But here's what happened after that. After Tuesday night, we, we, Tuesday night, we had told the guy who was going to come interview me for the paper that we weren't going to do it. Well, then he got called back and said, yeah, we, we did the meeting. We're going to do it again tonight, Wednesday night. Why don't you come? So this young man came and a young lady with him and he had a press badge on him. And he, after we got done, he said, do you mind if I interview you for our paper? And I said, no, that's, that's what I do. And he said, do you mind me recording you? And I almost laughed and I'm going, I, I get recorded all the time, so go ahead. And he asked, I mean, he had done his research. He knew about Hope Foundation. He knew about how many people we fed last year in Kenya. I mean, he knew all of that. And so he asked me these questions about our church, and he asked me questions about our ministries, asked me questions about UFOs, and I gave him very, very lengthy answers, because if you ask me what time it is, I'll tell you, boy, let's, let me show you how to make a watch. Then we'll get into what time it is. And so I gave him, I gave him enough things so that he could put it together into a news article, and that's going to go on the campus newspaper, and I don't know how many people are going to read it. But let's just say it's going to be more than 10. Because anything right now that says UFOs on it, there's a lot more people that actually read it or look into it than there was 10, 20 years ago. That's going to gain some people. Maybe, maybe some young college students who grew up in church, but then you know how it is, they go to college. Now they can smoke marijuana and get drunk and have girlfriends and boyfriends and go to parties and everything like that. And so they do that. But maybe there's a couple of them there that God's going to call back to His glorious mercy and turn their life around. Hallelujah. That's what it's about. So we'll just see what God does. We have no idea what we're going to do next year. Uh, but we're going, to, we're going to lay it out before the Lord and let Him do His work. But I'm just telling you. You may have witnessed to somebody for their whole life. Don't give up. Don't give up. You keep praying for them. Keep talking. Keep loving them. Keep loving them. Those college students were obviously not raised the way I was. Their college, we didn't have marijuana and alcohol at Bible college. Okay? We didn't have that where I went to school. Their, their life is altogether different than mine. But God put it in my heart to love every one of them. And especially when they came in with the tinfoil hats. I'm going, believe it or not, you're my crowd. Okay? So you pray for them. You pray for that couple that walked out Monday. You pray for that poor lady who was so bitter. It got to the point, she was kind of like sitting where Madison is. I, you're okay. But it got to where I wouldn't even look over there to her. Because every time I looked at her, she was just bitter, just full of, just full of venom and bile and everything like that. She just didn't like me. Well, I'll tell you who, she, who it is she don't like. She don't like God. That's her problem. So you pray for her, all right? Father, we come before you today. We thank you, God, uh, for this time. Lord, thank you, God. I, God, I thank you. Here, here it is again. God, I gave up. I've given up so many times. I've turned, I said, God, okay, that's enough. It's, it's all over with. God, you know me. And there, Father, you, you changed my mind. You showed me different. You are a good God. And I thank you, God, for opening my eyes to that, opening our eyes to that. Father, I pray, dear God, that today's testimony would be a blessing to somebody who's about ready to give up about ready to stop about ready to quit about ready to quit praying quit seeking after you father they're just tired you know how we get we get tired we get fed up we think that you're not doing anything we think that maybe we're so sinful that you can't work in our lives we think 
all kinds of things, Lord, that are not true. And so, Father, just I pray, dear God, that you would be good to us in spite of who we are, not because of who we are, because we don't deserve it. And Father, bless these people, bless these, all these young people, bless my heart. Because I remember being one of them, being that age. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just open up the word to them. And that couple Monday night, God, break their hearts. Break their hearts. And that woman, Wednesday. Father, she had, she had prickly, thorn devils all over her. She was so sour and so bitter. Father, she had, she had drunk the vine of Sodom and had partaken of its bitterness. And I pray, dear God, that you would give her a drink of the sweet wine of the word of God and Jesus Christ. God, that you would give her a drink of the, of the cool living waters that come out of you and your word. And Lord, that her life would be changed. Do it today, do it tomorrow, do it 20 years from now. But Father, would you save these people? We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.